So, we looked at covenant. We looked at righteousness. Covenant is what God cuts with us. There's a price to be paid, and there's benefits and consequences in the covenant of law, but there's only benefits in the covenant of faith. So, righteousness is the terms, living according to the terms, satisfying the terms. To be righteous is to be in right standing to the terms of the covenant. So what does holiness mean? Because we sometimes equate righteousness and holiness. Holy comes from the Hebrew noun kadesh, or the adjective kadosh. And it means to be set apart. That's That's the most significant meaning, to be set apart. It is not a common thing. It is set apart, and therefore it is a holy thing. When when, uh, tools in the temple, the instruments in the temple, were purified, they were set apart for only temple work, the priest didn't take the fork and butter knife home. Right? Because that was common and to be holy was to be reserved exclusively for this one thing. A thing that is holy is set apart and dedicated for an extraordinary thing and a limited thing. And if it is not set apart and becomes mixed, it's no longer holy because it's doing another thing. So, We have this trickle down, this cascade of what holy means, but we have to start with the primary understanding of being set apart. It's actually why the angels cry out, holy, 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 because every created thing that gazes upon God has to say, you are so different than us. You are so unlike us. The most glorious angel." If a cherubim or a seraphim were to land right in the room, right here. First off, we probably have the wrong conception of these things. It's probably about 90 feet tall and a wingspan greater than this room, and we would be terrified. We would fall down and think, holy. We would be tempted to worship that thing. And so I constantly in Revelation, these guys are showing up and it's like, don't, don't, no, no, don't do that. John's always falling down and, you know, thinking that thing is something other than what it is. And he's ha- he has to be told, don't do that. Don't worship me. But if one of those glorious angels descended, it would be so glorious, we would see something so unlike us that we would be tempted to worship it in its beauty and power. Those things look at God and say, We've never seen anything like you. Holy, holy, holy. They can't say it once. You got to, all you can say is holy, holy, holy. And then they fall down just to try to get a little relief because their entire system is overloading from the beauty and the power of this God who is altogether other than any other thing. But they can't stay there for long because they're too fascinated. They're like, I I barely caught my breath, but I just got to take holy, holy, holy. And there's this endless cycle of worship because he is holy in the extreme, set apart entirely from anything you and I have ever experienced. That is the essence of holiness, to be set apart. Because of that, something that is unmixed is holy. And to be unmixed is to be pure. Most of us spend our time talking about purity as holiness. I want to be holy, which means I want to be pure. But you've got to start where the story starts. Purity is a part of holiness, but purity alone is not holy. Your moral purity isn't what makes you holy. It's the consequence of being set apart. 
If you aren't set apart, you'll never be holy, no matter how morally pure you are. So when the command comes and says, be holy, we see the first and the third meaning occurring in phrases like holy and blameless. Paul said to the Ephesians, be holy and blameless or holy and without blemish. See, he's saying you need to be number one and number three. They aren't the same thing. They're two different things, but they're related. And so when you understand how to be holy, blamelessness can come. When you understand how to be holy, you can live set apart and be without blemish. And so there's a practical application of holiness, but if all we do is focus on the practical application and we don't understand what it means to be set apart, we will be striving endlessly for a purity that only comes once we are set apart. Most of our framework for holiness comes from the law. There's 45 occurrences in English of that phrase in the New King James alone. The Torah has 30 of the 45 and Leviticus alone has 20. Leviticus is like Ezekiel, right? How, many, uh, how, much, of, how much of your devotional time is spent in Leviticus? But we have 20 references in Leviticus to what it means to be holy, and Leviticus starts with the sacrifice of a lamb. Leviticus is where the Jews start their discipleship. Something has to die, and that thing has to be set apart and pure and spotless to even qualify for the death as this process of what it takes to atone for sin. It's a little bit of a rabbit trail. My point being, so much of our understanding of holiness comes from the rigid structure of the law where that word occurs mostly in our frame of reference. Speak to the congregation, Leviticus 19, and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. And all of a sudden we're like, how do we do that? Be as holy as he is? 1 Corinthians 7, 34, Paul desiring to secure undivided devotion pointed to how a married man's interests are divided. I'm quoting there. A married man's interests are divided and also the unmarried woman is anxious about the things of the Lord. Contrasting. A married man's divided interests, an unmarried man or woman is anxious about the things of the Lord. Instead, how to be holy, how to be set apart in body and spirit, while the married woman is anxious about worldly things. He's making a point, not don't get married. He's just saying there's a practical application here. When you're in relationship with someone at that level, you naturally are concerned about their well-being in a way that is mixed compared to the focus of someone who is singly set upon the Lord. And he's, it's just the trickle down of this. How do we live in purity with an unmixed spirit and be holy? It really does come down to real things we do in life he chose us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him without spot or wrinkle. The bride, that she would be holy and without blemish. It really does involve your character. It involves virtue. It involves choices you make. I'm not divorcing holiness from the real world. I'm saying that purity alone isn't holy. And if we don't get that at a foundational level, we will pursue purity and think that we have achieved holiness. And we will do it in such a way that we'll constantly rely on our own strength, which triggers failure that makes us feel impure 
and mixed. Peter told, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, 14, he said, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Your conduct and mine matters. But let me give just a few observations here. Modern discipleship has contributed to our confusion so that be holy often translates to the believer as become righteous or regain lost righteousness. And this is why we have to tease out these concepts and get our language right because if everything's the same, then why did God use different words? Righteousness is right standing according to the terms of the covenant. Holiness is to be set apart and purity of conduct is a result of being set apart. But when we say be holy, many of us feel like I've got to become righteous. What if you can't become righteous? What if the only thing you can do is receive righteousness? Now you're striving to be holy by achieving something you can only receive as a gift. And if you can only receive it as a gift, but you're thinking... I have to become more and more pure in my virtue versus my vice. You don't know which way is up. You're so confused in your spiritual ambition, it's no wonder you feel a sense of disappointment on a daily basis because you don't even know what you're trying to accomplish or what has been accomplished for you that you're just meant to receive. We get wrong mindsets and develop toxic spiritual narratives about God and ourselves because be holy as He is holy is an impossible command unless you go to sleep and let Him do something for you. Secondly, you can't start the conversation of sanctification with sanctification. You have to start with covenant. Here's an interesting thing, and I won't go into great detail on this. I'm going uh, I'm to wrap this session up fairly quickly. The first uh, appearance of the word sanctification happens in Genesis 2 when God says the Sabbath was sanctified. He sanctified the Sabbath. ESV translates that he made the Sabbath holy because sanctification and holy, sanctification is just the verb form of the noun holy. So to be holy is to be sanctified. To be sanctified is to be set apart. So when you are sanctified, when, those, when the temple instruments were sanctified, they were set apart. The setting apart is what made them holy. So you can't be holy unless you're sanctified, and sanctification is the verb form of the noun. So in Genesis 2, it says the Sabbath was sanctified or made holy. Well, here's a problem. Based on our understanding of holiness as moral purity, there was no sin yet. God sanctified or made something holy without any reference to sin. So now why are you referencing sin to try to be holy? Because the very first time the idea is introduced, it's not in reference to sin. And there's something called the principle of first occurrence, which means... When an idea is first introduced in Scripture, it sets the foundation of our understanding of every other use of that word or term throughout the rest of Scripture. So the idea of holiness or sanctification is introduced without reference to sin. And we spend the rest of our time trying to make ourselves holy completely in reference to sin. Number three, none of this, just observations out of this section, none of this is possible apart from the full drama of what God achieves in salvation by which you are literally born again. See, this is why you must be born again. The twice born are not merely declared righteous, they are made righteous. You didn't just get a magic wand waved over you and it's like, well, you're still a mess, but I'm going to say you're righteous. You are actually made righteous. In regeneration, you do not become a better version of you 
you become a part of a new race. You were born into Adam's race. You have been reborn into the race of God. Much of what we think holiness is about is trying to become a better version of us. And so we encourage each other. We teach along those lines. It's a self-improvement gospel. Rather than be holy, be set apart, as He is set apart. And the sanctifying work of that is not in reference to sin, but in reference to rest, because the Sabbath was what was sanctified. And that's the first use of the term Sabbath also. Sabbath and sanctification are linked right at the very beginning. You can't be set apart if you're awake and striving. You can only be set apart when you're at rest. Therefore, the Sabbath became a gospel prophecy because Adam was created on the sixth day and he took his first breath, his first full day as a living creature was in the Sabbath of God. He was created on the sixth day. God said there is a time that is actually going to contain my qualities. He sanctified the Sabbath and made it holy, which means a day in the calendar, and I'm not talking about Sunday, a moment in time now possesses God's qualities. And that's what Adam comes alive in. His first full day is in the rest of God. And that is a prophecy of the only way we can live. Amen. That's why you have been presented before God as holy. You who were once alienated and hostile in mind, He is now reconciled by His death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before Him. You can't be holy if He doesn't present you as holy. You can't be holy if you aren't set apart into Him. You can't be set apart into Him if you aren't resting in what He has done, which is the path of your sanctification, which leads to the purity. That's where we start. we got to back it up. 